Kieran, cheers for your time, mate. It's going to be great as an insight for everyone to understand your career because it's it's been quite long. No offence. And uh, <laughs> and also um, the way that you've been doing IT sales, right? So it's a little bit different to the other people I've been talking to that have been focused on more technical roles or marketing roles. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be quite insightful. I think we're going to get a lot from this session. So as an intro, I could just give everyone a, a hello and, and who you are and what you do. That'd be great. Brilliant. Okay, so my name's Kieran Morn. Um, I'm I run with my partner um, Jay. We run Nelco Limited. Um, I suppose you'd call us a a cybersecurity company, um, but we do also look at cost savings as well, um, and we also look at slightly different ways of making sure that uh, that people are safe and secure. Um, so we've been running that for around three years. But I have been in IT sales since late 1996, which seems a really, really long time ago now. Um, I think, yeah, it was it was not a thing that you were asked to do at school. Um, <laughs> so when you went to your careers teacher, there was a series of um, boring um, and old school, including draftsmen, believe it or not, was on on the list of things that you you could get offered to do. I'm making myself sound really old now. Um, but basically, um, I kind of came across IT sales quite by accident. Um, and uh, it was a, I think there was an ad in the paper, and my friend, we, we both worked at EMAP. So e EMAP was a publishing business. So we were in the advertising side of that business. And um, I think I, I worked quite well because I could sell on different magazines, um, which I think ultimately got me the job in IT sales. Mm. Uh, because I proved that I could sell on a classic car magazine or a walking magazine or, a, I don't know, a fishing magazine. So you just understood what the unique points of that magazine were, its readership. Yeah. You get into the, into, the, into the head of the advertiser a little bit and you understand what they need. So I think that's probably what got me the job in, in IT initially is the fact that I was flexible. Um, and, what, and what kept you there, right? Because you've been doing that now for, for many, many years. Um, I quite enjoy tech, um, although I'm not a techie. Um, I like the technical side of it and it interests me. Um, I, won't, I won't deny I don't mind the money. Uh, the money was a lot better than the publishing side. I mean, when I went for my interview, um, I turned up in, I think, a ratty 2CV um, that was held together with goodwill. Um, and the car park was full of BMWs and Porsches. And I thought, oh, this is quite good. Um, if I'm any good at this, then this will be good. So I got the interview um, and they'd offered me exactly what my previous company had offered me. And I was in there for three or four years and had a proven track record. And this IT chap said, yeah, you seem great. Here's, here, here's your, here's your um, comp plan. Comp plan? Hang on. So I can, oh, this is good. So the harder I work, the more I earn. That's quite good and obviously in my previous life that wasn't there so i just saw that and saw saw the fact that it was an emerging market and cracked on yeah and we'll, um, we'll probably touch on your interest of cars and the whole rockstar car things a bit later on right yeah um but if we think about the journey right so obviously you're at the publishing company and then you traversed your way through various roles over the years um what do you say the most memorable moment was um there will be a few points where you realise that you're getting good at something, I think. Um, in fact, it, it, I've noticed this throughout life, is, is people start getting competitive when they actually start getting really good at something. There's a sort of a second drive comes in almost, if you like. Um, and I think back in the sort of turn of the millennium, I'd worked out that I'd, I'd gone through the rise and I was selling a lot. Um, my work-life balance, which we'll come on to later, wasn't that bad. It was quite good. Um, and I thought, well, I could probably do better than this. So you strive to, to work harder and harder and harder. And there'll be a few points where, you know, you win a certain order and obviously can't mention the client names because uh, for, for client reasons, but there's certain orders in my career that you go, wow, that was a turning point. And then there's certain things that that led to, whether that was, you know, I bought my first car or first Porsche when I was like 20. I bought a 
didn't eat up when I was 26. That was quite a big milestone. As you said, cars are, cars are important to me. Um, and I inadvertently used them as a benchmark through my career of, of you do well, what can I have next? Um, yeah. Which is which has been good because I've been out, luckily enough, you know, I've been in good health and I've managed to, to work hard and earn decent money and, and spend that on things I've enjoyed. Um, but yeah, looking at it, it's, it is an interesting journey. And I don't know if it's, a, it's a, probably a journey you could go on now, but probably not from the crude style that we found in the 90s. Um, now, I don't know if it's too early to talk about it, um, but credentials. So what mm. credentials um, did I stroke we have back in the back in the 90s? So um, we spent the whole lockdown um, as, as Nelco Limited attaining our crest credit accreditation, which, as you probably know, is uh, is quite arduous. It's quite thorough um, and it's taken many different iterations throughout the summer with various auditors to get that right. Um, and then I look back at my early 90s. What was my training? What was my methodologies? Um, and I was scratching around, but I did find some early stuff. So here you go. Here's my Microsoft Outlook 2000 sales course. Look at that. <laughs> um, here's my Microsoft XP sales certificate. <laughs> but the one I was most proud of um, was this. Might need to edit my stupidity. There we go. Uh, the compact so, bag. Yeah. So um, when I started, um, you could sell laptops and you could sell desktops, but you couldn't sell servers. Um, you had to be accredited to sell servers, which is one of the few things that you had to be accredited to do. Um, and obviously the business had no rel, um, Windows, um, Exchange, they, they, they had the, the, the full MCSE program had, was just starting and we had the group wise and all that sort of stuff. And they, they were all accredited, the engineers. But there was very little for the salespeople, unlike today. Um, so my training when I was given training was there's the yellow pages, there's the system, off you go. <laughs> that was literally my training, um, which is bizarrely what we've been talking about a lot through this lockdown is peer, peer review um, and peer mentoring. So back in those days, and you're too young to remember, they would be like a not quite green screen, but uh, we used to use a system called R-Base, which is a very um, DOS-based tab. You got Everything is a tab and an mm. escape, rather than now everything is a window and a GUI. Um, and literally, if you forgot where you were in this thing, you could literally stand looking at it for 20 minutes. Nothing in your brain would make you work out what to do next. And that could be losing an order you'd spent 20 minutes loading up unless you remembered the next F button in the right order. Now, sometimes you'd have your colleague next to you sort of seeing you struggle and they go, press F11, you blank. Brilliant, okay, press F11, all is good. The world is good again. Um, however, um, I'm not actually sure how the current Teams stroke Zoom methodologies are gonna work with peer mentoring of you know, juniors and interns and what have you. It'd be, be interesting to see what the new world develops in 2021 as a kind of a hybrid solution. Um, but back in back when I started, there was only peer review. There was no formal training at all. Um, and yeah, you're kind of mighty proud of the Compact Server course one because it was a two day course. Um, and the second day um, was, uh, you had to struggle through it with a hangover. Because um, <laughs> Compact took you out on the uh, on the first evening. I don't. I think you just basically had to be there and had to know how to spec up a server. And as we all know, it's largely the same as specking up a laptop, really, but just with some more questions you need to ask. Um, but I think back in the day, it was made out to be some big mythical thing. Um, but of course, it's not. It's just asking a couple of extra questions. But uh, but it's good to see that the industry has got, um, I suppose, more regulated in terms of its qualifications for its salespeople over the last 25 years. Because uh, yeah, back in those days, I, th I would imagine it was a sort of Stetson or a pair of, pair of spurs. Yeah, more than likely. And if about 
the, the day in a life right of <clears throat> of yourself now and obviously you're running yep. your own business now so it could be quite varied but what does that what does that look like um bizarrely every day well i think the one thing that kept me in it sales um or in, in my job in it from the 90s was the fact that no job no, no, no day was ever the same um ever um apart from during lockdown it felt a bit like groundhog day um but, but typically um no day would ever be predictable and i think that's what kept me in this game for so long um and like you just said working in a smaller business um everything or every decision is based with you and, and your, your your small team of peers so yeah no no day is ever the same so i get involved with sales obviously um, but some of the project management I do a bit of, um, and I quite like that. Um, I don't do so much with the tax and the books. I tend to, that not, that doesn't really interest me, um, that much. Um, and then you get to do things like, um, sort of planning marketing and what the brand looks like and all that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, which actually, I suppose I did in my degree, which was nearly 30 years ago now. Um, so it's good to see, to, to actually get back into that again. Um, to try and drive that brand and to try and drive it to where it needs to be effectively um because what we didn't want to do is is, is have a brand that said kieran's computers <laughs> that was yeah. just not not where we wanted to go um so yeah every day is absolutely different um and you get up and although you might have a plan of what you want to do um invariably it doesn't you don't always stick to that yeah is, which is good. <laughs> Which is good, right? Because variety is the spice of life and everything. So yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think boring isn't good. Boring, boring is not helpful for the brain or the soul. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Although I must admit, I do miss going to London. I do miss going to see clients. Um, this is very good. This sort of interaction, um, and it's almost become a norm now. Um, so where you where you might phone somebody, even I'm doing it. Oh, quick, quick Teams call. Because, um, which is really good. However, unless we're all careful, we'll end up on back-to-back -back teams and we won't get as, so we think we've got, we, we can get more done in a day on teams because there's no travel time. No. So if you're traveling to me, that's great. But if you were just doing a quick call, actually you get less done on teams. So it's gonna be a fine, fine a balance. Um, but I think as human beings, we do need to see each other and interact with each other properly. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that, that we'll take away from the year is digital transformation has been forced upon many organizations. Um, some of it's gone well, some of it hasn't gone well because some, some of the um, networks were protected as, as well as they might ought to have been. But um, that's, a, that's a discussion for later. But um, it's, it's, it, it's going to be an interesting year to see what next year looks like. Um, yeah, definitely. And for anybody who's watching this and wondering why, why Kieran bounces like Tigger, it's because he's sat on a bouncing ball for his core stability. Um, to keep himself active whilst he's sat at his desk, right? So, uh, so yeah, unfortunately, yeah, apologies for the bouncing. <laughs> so everyone's sat there thinking, God, this guy's all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, uh, new office chair on order. Perfect. And so I think this, like, from a finish line perspective, right? Because everyone has this view that I'm going to retire at X. This is what's going to happen. And I think Simon Murdoch summed it up. It's not like a, a big parade and the fanfare and all that kind of stuff, right? But um, what, what would you say your finish line is? What you're aiming for? I don't know, really. I think everybody I know who's retired, um, who's planned it well and eased into retirement whilst keeping busy, um, has had a really good time, has had a really good retirement. Um, assuming that I don't find this role and this business too stressful, um, keep going for another 20 years. Mm. Um, because it's only the, the only problem that you have is stress. So uh, I know a couple of um, former IT director clients of mine and they, they um, had, you know, a point where they said, oh, I've earned enough money now, but I don't want to retire. So one of them uh, works on the checkout in Waitrose. Yeah. Because he really, really enjoys going out for a, a shortened shift to meet people. He loves meeting people. 
Um, it's no stress at all. Um, so that and, and he gets out and he earns some money. So therefore, he says he can play more golf um, yeah. because his, his wife says, "Well, you, you can spend all your waitress money on your golfing," which he does. Um, so it's a matter of planning what you're doing because if you've had a busy work life and you know as of next monday i'm retired i've got nothing to do mm. and, and I, I don't think that helps you, you, there's a risk right you could just become sedentary and you could just be sat there watching the good old goggle box yep. and uh and just spend the rest of your life sat in an armchair watching tv with the occasional walk around the block because the dog needs it right and for as much as that may sound like bliss to some people, it's not good for you at all. No, it's not. <laughs> and I think also the other thing is it, the brain is like a muscle. Um, so if you don't use it properly, it will start to fail. Um, if you don't keep it challenged daily with probably more, just just slightly more tasks than you can cope with, that to me keeps it alert and busy. Um, mm. The mind also has the ability to be negative. Um, if you have nothing on, then um, you can't just turn the mind off. The mind just doesn't turn off. So if you were to sit there and do nothing, you're, you might daydream away in a very positive way. Um, mm. It might be quite negative. You know, I'm not doing anything anymore. No one loves me. I'm going to sit here all eat worms. Um, or just keep busy. Keep busy in yeah. your life. Um, so I think... That's the that's again the work life balance. Come back to your work life balance thing. Is your retirement needs to be planned so that you are busy enough to enjoy life and do some travelling or do whatever it is that you want to do, but have enough that your brain is constantly fed with information and learning and keep learning as well. I think that's yeah. Um, and on that on that point of learning, right? Um, we make a lot of mistakes through our careers and through life in general, but is there a mistake that you made during your career that you, you learned a very val valuable lesson from? Um, probably. Um, I, think, I think the thing to do is to admit that you make mistakes and that you make mistakes on a daily basis. Uh, the difference is learning by the, by the mistakes um, and not making them Hopefully again, but occasionally you will make the same mistake again, um, but not too repetitively. I think that's the thing. And, and just not beat yourself up for making mistakes. Um, in a busy job, you make hundreds of decisions a day. Um, and those decisions will be relation, relationship-wise. They'll be technical. They'll be commercial. And there's so many different things that you've got to do. Um, and you know, occasionally you'll lose an order because of one of one of those things you've either not thought about or misjudged or assumed. I mean, to assume is not a great thing. Um, so again, you can't beat yourself up over one teeny little error because otherwise you won't make decisions. And I think that's one of the things that makes people better is the ability to make decisions quickly and decisively. Um, and occasionally you'll get it wrong. Um, and I think that that might be the point then is understanding that and understanding that sitting there analyzing or over analyzing something isn't going to change it if it's just don't do the same thing again. Yeah. And if we think about it, we mentioned before around uh, work life balance and, and, and all those kind of things. But do you think you made any sacrifices along the way or has it been? fairly good for yourself I think. I think it's been fairly good I mean I work longer hours than some of my friends um, but also I work less hours than some of my other friends in other careers so I've mm. got friends who are you know musicians who go on tour who don't see their kids for months I've got friends who work on tv and yeah they can go for a week at a time on a set uh, I've got friends who are in the military they'll go off for two or three years um, so actually I think most evenings I've been back to say goodnight to the kids. Um, so I think, yeah, that's, and, and when they were younger, I think I consciously tried to make sure they're at least three out of the seven nights to say goodnight. Yeah. So, so I think I've done okay. You know, could I have done a nine to five? Yeah, possibly. Um, would I have been as fulfilled and, 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 and enjoyed life and, 
been on as many jollies as I've been on and that sort of thing by doing a nine to five, probably not. So yeah, it's, it's that balance, right. isn't it? And, and if you're fun. looking, if you're looking back at yourself or at new people joining the IT industry now from a sales point of view, what, what three tips would you be giving them? Oh God, yeah. Um, I think the, the three tips would be just, you know, work hard, um, be humble, um, you know, clients, clients buy from people fundamentally and they buy from people they like. Um, mm. So I think being, I can't say be likable because that's tricky because that's in the eye of the beholder. But, you know, just try not to believe your own publicity. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I would say when you're getting into sales, try and get into something that's not closed. Mm. So I, I liked the, the reseller world more than vendor world because it meant that I could be more of a trusted advisor. So again, I'll, I'll mention a name from the past, Toshiba. Um, so we used to sell a lot of the Toshiba laptops. Um, and back in the day, you'd sell Sony Bios, if you remember that, how cool they were. Um, and if I'd have worked for a vendor, I couldn't have sold those cool things, the, 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 the Portage and the, uh, and the Bios to the directors. It'd be, yeah, I'm afraid we don't do those. We have this one, this one, that'd be boring. Um, whereas Reseller World allowed me to provide the client exactly what they wanted, which was actually, it's a good feeling. So a client says, can I have? And you go, yes, yes, you can. Here you go. Here's your quote. Um, nobody likes to say no to a client. Um, but if that saying no is a fundamental, yeah, no, we can't help you with that line of business entirely, that didn't strike me as a good idea. Um, especially if in vendor world that might only come around every three or four years. Mm. Um, that meant that you wouldn't be building a long-term relationship with clients. Um, you would get to know them briefly for a short period of time, then in another three years for a short period of time. And I wanted that sort of constant experience with the clients which i've kind of got so it's good yeah and i think um i've been having i'm not in sales right ultimately well i went for a sales business but uh, ultimately yeah. a technical individual and um it is interesting to see new people coming into the sale right and people come and go um people do look at it and think oh i'm going to make a ton of money uh, and then i'm going to go and travel for for three years because i can afford to do so and then they come in and they get basically a glorified yellow pages now, right? Which is ultimately a CRM of some sort. Yep. And then you're then hammering the phones, getting constant rejection and no leave me alone kind of scenarios, right? And I think from a sales point, one thing that a lot of technical people forget is, is that the amount of amount of stress and stress and pressure that adds with that constant rejection, as well as then a target that you're trying to aim for as well, right? Yeah, you do need skin like an elephant. Um, and back in the day there weren't many resellers. So people wouldn't have 20, 50 calls a day. They might have one or two. So invariably when I was cold calling in the late nineties, early noughties, to you, and invariably one out of three cold calls, you would get the ability to quote. Mm. Um, because online, bizarrely, wasn't even a thing in those days. Um, yeah. So it was, you would buy off a reseller or of somebody like Insight or Misco, and that was, um, or you could buy direct from Gateway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the Gateway PCs. So um, yeah, it's changed a lot, and then of course it's got more competitive over that period. And then to add, I, I guess the extra sting in the tail recently, then you have GDPR. Mm -hmm. So you will you will phone a client, uh, or sorry, you will phone a prospect um, who will say, "How did you get my number?" Yeah. And they quite understandably will be quite uppity um, because there is the law in place to say that you can't do that to a point. Yeah, this is um, probably the 50th phone call of the day. <laughs> and it's probably his 50th phone call of the day. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's changed and that must be much, much, much harder. So therefore your skin must be much harder as a salesperson. Um, and the thing is that I suppose you've got to take the knocks, but what's the worst thing that can happen is someone can say no. 
Mm. So out of picking up the phone and dialing somebody, the outcome can be a no, go away, or, oh, yes, it could be the start of something new. So I always looked at the, the this could be the start of something new, rather than someone's going to tell me to bugger off. Uh, yeah, definitely. And throughout your career, right, is there been, there's always been those moments, right, where you feel like things are maybe getting a little bit too much, and a lot of the times you can sit there and overcome it, you can reset your mind and all those kind of things, but has there ever been any point in your career where you thought, that's it, I'm jacking it, I'm quitting, and, and then manage to reset yourself and overcome that? Um, apart, from every, apart from every Monday morning. <laughs> um, not not a particularly bad one. Um, I mean, I think there are times when work gets really busy and you know, you have a home life and suddenly you think maybe that could be easier um, if I wasn't working such long hours or when I was at home, I wasn't thinking about work um, or mm. doing conference calls into the evening. Um, and I did struggle when dad died. So that was important to me and didn't expect it. And it did kick me in the, the, the googie somewhat. Um, and there is a point that makes you think, mm. Yeah, it what's, it all, what's it what's it all about? Um, you know, typically a, a child is 20, 25 to 35 years younger than the parent. So you go, mm -hmm. oh, that means I've only got 25 to 35 years left myself. Good, what do I do with that time? Um, and all these sort of things that, that you hadn't previously thought of when you lose somebody close. So, yeah, there is a point where you think, is there... Um, is there something better out there? So for sure. But but like you say, you, you get through it, you dust yourself off, you use the coping mechanisms that you've got um, and hopefully turn it into something positive. Um, so if you think about the industry, I suppose the industries have changed a lot since, since, since the days of gateway PCs and stuff, right? But um, what would you say is the biggest change that you've seen and experienced? Um, what, from the industry or in what we're offering technology-wise? I think either, right? Because I think they kind of come hand in hand a little bit because technology isn't the be-all and end-all now, right? I think cultural changes impacts that as well, um, as well as the demand from consumers now being astronomically um, more technically savvy than it's ever been before. Um, consumers are more savvy. Um, if you look at the effects of this pandemic, um, we've been talking on Microsoft Teams. Um, many people have since March and they've not been into the office. They might not go back in until March next year. Who knows? Um, but I did speak to one client and they said, oh, this is brilliant. This is, uh, I said, yes, we do. And they said, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we've, we've got this now. And I said, you do know that over the years I've sold you laptops since 1999. I've sold you four or five revisions of laptops in that time. And since about 2009, we would have been able to do what we're doing now. And suddenly the penny dropped. And actually, from a technology point of view, um, they could have done what they're doing now. But mm -hmm. culturally, the culture has changed that this becomes the new norm. And I'm fairly sure that um, the next gen of kids, they're either on on space time all the time, um, they, they consume in a different way. So I think that's probably the next experience that we've got to go through is we are second gen techs, I suppose. Our kids are first gen techs, so they've grown up with it. Um, they consume media in a much faster um, and all enveloping way than we do. Um, and that we did, you know, I think I got my first computer at, 12 or 13 it was a zx81 um i think it had 1k ram which was uh which is fairly poor so you could stick a um you, you could stick a, a ram extension on the back which gave you another 16k um but if you had a game that had sound you had to unplug the ram and put the sound card in <laughs> so technology's moved from that in the 80s to the late 90s i think that was that was a big big stride um mm. and then i suppose since then we've just 
got more joined up. Everything's more joined up. Um, yeah. We are more together, you know, my, my, you could probably tell from your phone, you know, where you've walked over the last yeah. four years or something, which probably 10 years ago would have been unheard of. Um, and what and we've kind of touched on the pandemic a couple of times, right? And yeah. it's having positive and negative impacts on people in different ways. What, what do you see the most common positive and negative impact is from your customer base? Uh, the, I suppose... The negative, um, so if you look, you, you object it in two ways. So the home life um, is better for most people because they're not traveling, they're spending more time with their families, their grass is shorter because they can mow it more often, um, and all sorts of you know small intangible benefits. Um, however, if um, is that company able to work? In many cases, they can't. Um, if it's hospitality, if it's events or something like that. So it's been it's been a dreadful, dreadful time for many, many businesses. Um, but it's a, it's a difficult one to understand because everybody works in a, in a different way. Um, there's a lot of people struggle with that coming into work and talking about last night's telly for half an hour. That's clearly not happening or just moaning about the roads for half an hour actually might be quite cathartic to somebody at the end of their commute. Um, that's not happening. You, you know, you wander downstairs, hopefully you got dressed um, and you sit in front of your computer and you might have a series of calls to do for that day. Um, I don't know if that's maybe rewarding for some. I think certainly, luckily we can, you know, most of what I do is interaction with other people. So, well, I feel a bit cheated because I don't go and physically meet people, can't take clients to lunch, can't do an event, um, can't do any, an open networking thing. So it's quite prescriptive and, and restrictive in that way. But actually, it, I can pretty much phone hundreds of people and get them on a team's call and catch up. Um, so that's good for me. But many people's jobs won't allow them to do that. So I guess people will be struggling with, you know, their job allows them to do a a certain amount of things. Oh. I think a lot of people in the in the tech industry, right? I think have been very fortunate in this pandemic because a lot of us have been able to carry on doing what we were doing. Not all of us, but a lot of us. Whereas, like my my brother is an example. He's a musician. Uh, he was on the Disney Cruise Liner, and obviously cruises got docked, and the performing arts industry ultimately collapsed, <laughs> right? Which now means he's he's had to get a normal job, and then. Lo and behold, lockdown two has happened in the UK and he's now from his normal job on furlough. <laughs> so he's just like, yeah. for, the, for the love of God, he can't get a stable job. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, for, it's those people, for as much as, for as, much as I'm t my brother is an instance, it's those people that are now trying to work that are getting penalised in some way, shape or form because they, they just can't find a, a position that allows them to keep a, a fluid work cycle over the last few months of this year yeah no absolutely um it's been the biggest change in our liberties since the last what since the last world war ii uh, mm. nothing nothing has had this much of an impact um i can't remember if i told you i had a, a very close friend die at the start of the pandemic and and i, I think that kind of made it re much much more realistic to me the fact that my friend, I spoke to him on the, the week before, um, and uh, yeah, he was gone within a week. And he was 10 years older than me, 10, 15 years older than me, so he wasn't that old. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and then, then you kind of go, well, wow, wow, let's just, uh, if, the, if, the, if they say knuckle down and stay at home, I can do that. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not probably done anybody's mental health any good long term, so. And no, some form of normality. Yeah, hopefully. And I think I'm hoping next year uh, at some point, right? I, I'm not going to lie. I think it's going to be well into the late end of next year before things even get anywhere near a normal or old normal or whatever this new normal and whatever people keep branding it as, right? But before anyone can actually realistically get back together properly is at least back end of next year, in my opinion, I think. It'd be it'd be unethical and morally wrong for 
for example, to run a conference in the summer next year of tens of thousands of people from different countries. If we haven't got a a vaccine that's, you know, that's reliable and available, then yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there's even a chance then though, right, that slightly off topic, but you don't really know how reliable these things are until at least good 12, 18 months down the line, right, and how many mutations happen in the short to midterm that then cause that that vaccine to be useful or non-useful. And I think that's that's the bit, don't get me wrong, I think it's a positive step towards finding a, a, a helping hand to getting people back to normal. But I think people also need to take a step back and think, well, it's not going to be available for at least another six months, really, at least. And even when it is, it's going to take a considerable amount of time to globally roll this out. <laughs> well, also, to send you down a reading rabbit hole, um, Google... Um, Denmark and Mink. Yeah, uh, no, definitely not. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, um, so who knows? So I think we're gonna have to be on our toes for the next few years. So yeah, I agree. We have no concept of of what events, what gigs look like. Um, so I, I didn't go to four gigs this year. Um, they'll reschedule for next year. Um, I think we've got a couple of extra. So we've got six gigs scheduled for twenty twenty one now which you're getting excited about but i do i do feel that they'll probably half of them will be cancelled again yeah well we'll soon see but fingers crossed that they don't fingers crossed yes Um, so what what technology is taking your interest at the moment um i suppose you'd call you call it open source it used to be called freeware um so if you look at Many of our great companies or our great brands these days, you look at Facebook, you look at Netflix, you look at Amazon, their tech stack is open source. Um, they've used open source. Um, they've generated a, a, and mutated the code. Um, and because it's open source and because they're open source collaborators, they then pass back to the open source community. The open source community then benefits from, I suppose, that, that code generation. Um, so I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that there's a point in where we work is a client requires certain controls to improve their security. Um, and if they have no budget, particularly budgets are tight at the moment, um, depending on which industry you're in, your first choice can often be, well, have you, have you looked and considered open source? Um, mm. And arguably, if they have the technical abilities to look after the open source products. There are enterprise ready open source products now. Governments are looking at it. Um, so, so open source fascinates me. Um, and I think in many ways that will be the next, the, we, we have a branded, we have branded software. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the branded software is expensive. Some of it's good value. Um, each one has a, its place in the market. Just the same as so does a managed service, so does software as a service. Um, but I think to look at the open source first um, is a good way to be, because in many, many cases, if you want to have a certain amount of functionality, in many of the paid products, it will have 10 times the functionality that you're ever going to use. Mm. So if your requirement is to, to store logs and to centralize your, your logs, for example, um, for maybe PCI, for example, or just so that you can examine your logs as one one single pane. Um, arguably, open source will do that standing on its head. Yeah, and I think there is a conversation on open source. I think the biggest thing that a lot of customers I speak to open source about is that um, they, they, they feel, you know, you obviously get enterprise open source, right, which allows you to buy a support wrap, which gives you a yeah. little bit more support than you'd normally get. Right. But most of the most of the open source products that are out there don't offer that level of support, which is why a lot of people still look at the main blue chips, right? Because they know they're going to get a a satisfaction at the end of it that says, if I have a problem, I know that Kevin in whatever call center has got me covered, right? Yeah, Um, absolutely. And and again, I think everything is a risk-based decision. Um, And I think when you look at paid product, apart from some of the some of the paid product has obviously a special source. It has some extra mm. special functionality that you don't get in open source. Um, but the other thing that you get in paid product is, like you say, support, the extra support, the extra peace of mind. But you also get 
ease of ease of working with it. So in many ways, you know, you would need to have a more Linux based techie team to look yeah. at some of the open source stuff. But actually, that's not a problem if a you have a Linux based techie team, or you then go, well, hang on, there's two or three products that we're looking at here. Why don't we employ a, a, a Linux admin? Let's look at that. Let's actually spend some money on people. I love yeah. the idea of people. Um, the world is talking about AI at the moment, um, and AI is great to a point, um, but apparently this is really clever. Um, this has got some AI in it, um, and human beings are often overlooked these days. Um, so clients look at us a bit funny when we say, oh, thought of employing some more people, um, mm. which seems a very old fashioned thing to say. Um, but people are, especially with security, they can be, they can take a, a false positive and spot it, whereas a system often can't. Um, so it's a mix of understanding what you need and what your clients' capabilities are, I suppose, um, and then finding something that fits. But yeah, I, I'm fascinated with open source because of its very nature um, and the fact that people do this for free. Um, and they do it for the love of it, and there's some great products out there. Yeah, there is. There's, there's, there's loads, and I think um, if we, we think about moving on from that, right? So there's, there's generally like unsung heroes of technology, like bits of technology, open source or paid for products that you've got a million and one features and functionalities in it, right? That one percent take use of. Um, is there any unsung heroes of tech that, that you've used daily, or you see customers using that it's worth a shout out? Um, I mean, yes and no. I mean, we, we would generally say the open source community. So I looked at this question. I thought, that's just the, that's just the open source world. Go go to the open source world and have a look. Um, just just download some of the products and, and have a play. But I mean, there are there are many things that are worth looking at. Um, many, what, one of the things that we advocate is a product called Simple Risk, um, which is a risk based product. Um, mm -hmm. It's it, it's open source to a point, uh, and obviously, like many of the open source um, products, they do charge you to take extra functionality. But yeah. the product is still is still great value. It's free, and then when you want the extra extra functionality layer, it's quite good value. Um, but if you haven't got a sim, uh, any form of risk based software, and it's a spreadsheet, it ideally ought not be a spreadsheet. Or mm. a spreadsheet is better than nothing. I suppose it's like anything else, isn't it? What have you got in? Well, we've got a piece of paper. Well, that's better than nothing. An Excel spreadsheet is better than a piece of paper. Simple risk is better than an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, unless you're trying to capture a large amount of data like COVID track and trace systems, right? And things that doesn't work well in Excel. One couldn't possibly call it. <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely, yeah. Um, so I think that's some of those products that you can start fairly easily. Um, and document some of the, the risk journeys. Most, most people don't do it. Um, and they won't also get sign off for a risk based product. Yeah, agreed. because it doesn't have a, you know, will it solve a problem? Well, it solves a problem that doesn't exist, which is looking at risk. Mm. So many things like that don't get signed off. So, so yeah, and, and again, you know, um, I think probably at the end of this, people will go, well, actually, maybe if it's open source, come and talk to us. Um, we can always point you in the right direction um, or some of the forums or um, we've got experience of, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, but I would say that if you're evaluating product and budget is tight, look at going open source um, yeah, rather than not doing something at all. I think that's the thing that, that people struggle with. I can't afford a scene or I can't afford this um, particular piece of EDR. Um, so we won't do it and we'll take the risk. Well, I think it's probably better that you go to open source, have something in place, than take the risk of, 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 of not detecting Nothing. it at all. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and you might actually find the open source is fit for purpose for three, four, five years. Yeah, yeah, more, more often than not, no, that's for sure. And let's go on to some lightning round questions, right? So your last technology purchase? Uh, it's a Philips 49 inch curved screen. Um, nice. It's lighting the side of my face at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
um, yeah, um, it's a great thing. Um, uh, we've now got to upgrade the graphics card in my PC because um, you got a YouTube video and you go, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's de it's demand for it's demand for feeds and power is ridiculous. Um, but I think the plan was I can fit three screens on one, mm -hmm. and actually I can, so that's really good. So I can be on a Teams call, I can have some email notes on one side and a spreadsheet about the numbers on the other side, and that's really good. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, although it does look a little like a command centre. Yeah. Um, and who's your biggest inspiration? Um, probably, uh, probably, uh, probably my dad. Um, so he, you know, the life he had was, he had various struggles through life, including dys dyslexia, um, mm. which ordinarily I can normally say. Um, and he'd gone through life and changed careers three or four times as, 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 as he needed to as, as time went on. But he was always positive um, and he was always had the ability to change. Um, mm. all, always had the ability to be funny. Um, probably arguably when he wasn't always that happy inside but yeah. you know i think yeah there's there's loads of people like you know i could say um i don't know people like alan sugar well, he's a great businessman and he knew when to quit and all this sort of stuff and steve jobs and but yeah i think it's quite close to home i think um and if you know if if, if i can be as cool as my dad then and my kids think that in 25 years then i've done a reasonable job yeah what does work-life balance look like to you? Um, I think well, I, hmm, that's interesting because currently we've made it so that because um, obviously we're in lockdown life um, and we've made a series of I suppose nights to make sure that we have um, family time so we make our own pizzas on a Friday that's non-negotiable curry night Saturday night games night Sunday night um, through the week, um, we also try and have tea at the same time and have, have an evening meal together. Um, yeah. You know, I might go off and do a couple of hours or three hours on the PC after that, but we'll, we'll sit and we'll talk about the day. Um, obviously, we've been anyway 2020 so far, so our skiing holiday didn't happen. In fact, we did have a holiday at the start of the year. We went to India um, for a friend's daughter's wedding, which was epic. Um, and we got back just just in time for for, for, for lockdown, which was nice. Um, but um, you know, ordinarily it would be spending time together, whatever that looks like. Um, and I think because we because we've got a bit more flexibility, it allows us to get up earlier, do some tasks, so we can spend yeah. that bit more time with the kids. Because as they get older, they will like us progressively less. Um, as they become teenagers. Yeah, de definitely. I think it's not necessarily like it, right? I think it's the reliance is less and less. And then that that makes us feel like we're less liked when actually they like us just as much, they just don't want to be with us as much. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think my friend told me a great, great analogy. And, and now I can, now my, my kids are sort of 12 and 15, I can kind of see that. Um, she so said, the problems at the start are small and often. And as you go through life, the problems get less, but the problems get bigger. Mm. I didn't really understand what he meant. And then you, you sort of go through the nappy period and then toddler period, the school period. And yeah. then you've got boyfriends, girlfriends, houses, jobs and all the things. And yeah. Um, so hopefully at the end of it, they'll still like us. Yeah, definitely. And um, what did you want to do when you finished school? I would be a rock star. <laughs> yeah. You play the bass, right? I do play the bass, yeah. And I recently took it back up again, and we got our old university band back together for the day, which was quite enjoyable. Nice. Um, nice. I don't think we played together in something like 23 years. Uh, and we could still more or less do it, which was good. Yeah, awesome. And favourite book? Uh, probably Haynes Manual. <laughs> yeah, for any car. For any <laughs> car. <laughs> well, for... I've got cars now that they don't do a Haynes manual for, which is really annoying. Um, so most of my sort of late teens, early 20s was spent reading Haynes manuals and working out how to fix what I'd just broken. 
So I'd say I've spent most of my time with my nose in books. Obviously, I like to read rock biographies and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think milestone books got to be a Haynes man in me. Yeah, cool. Um, most important thing to you? Um, I think it's probably got to be the family. Um, at the end of the day, you can have stuff. Stuff's nice, cars are nice, nice watches are lovely, but they don't mean anything really without family. Mm. Um, and so I think that's probably the most important thing. Fam family and mates. I think I think mates. We have a small small net family, and I think and a lot of really good friends, which I'm I'm blessed with. Um, and you know, it's been been good to during this pandemic to talk to your mates. Um, be it on teams or when we were allowed out briefly to the pub, um, yeah, in, the, in that briefest of periods. But yeah, I mean, I think family and mates is the best thing, and and also mates are mates, mates. You see, you can help each other. I think. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah, I think that's the thing 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 to take away from the year is uh, is mates and family. Yeah. And. Words of wisdom, if it was a tweet. Uh, what I did write? Yes, um, I think words of wisdom, if it was to be a tweet, would be be excellent to each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I think has actually come out in cinemas now, isn't it? When you're gonna it does. Yeah, I haven't seen has. it yet, because um, I haven't dared to go near a cinema, but I imagine it will be on you can watch it. Um, I think you can watch it on digital cinema, so you can actually sign up to watch it from home. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah, I, I I think that's how I watched it. If not, then obviously that shows what I get up to. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it'll be interesting to see um, because obviously the the first one was utterly epic. The second yeah. one less so. Um, but sometimes where they go back and they revisit a theme, actually yeah. it comes back as good as the first. I, I think I think it's in between the first and the second. I think it was good. So long as you have the slapstick comedy Bill and Ted mentality going into it, yeah. Um, if you go into it thinking that it's going to be revamped and turned into something that it wasn't when it was originally released, then it's going to be an epic failure for you because it is trying to cling to the core roots of what it was when it was released many, many, many years ago. Uh, yes. But yeah, definitely, it's definitely worth a watch. Okay, um, I will do that. And let's just ask another couple of questions. So. Um, favourite song? I did this the other day for an interview. I think it's probably Gimme Shelter by the Wrong Stones. Yeah, good song. Um, uh, it's, it's one of those songs that can apply to many different things, but also it's a really good driving song. So that kind of helps. Yeah, definitely. And um, obviously you've been doing the Rockstars Cars stuff. Yep. Um, so I think just, just before we close off the session, right, I think where can people find you online, the Rockstars Cars brand and all that so kind of stuff? What's coming Rockstars, up with that that people can look yeah. out for? So Rockstars Cars, um, so at Rockstars Cars on Twitter is probably where you'll see the majority of what we do. Um, you'll see us on Facebook as well. We have a, a healthy Facebook group. Um, we have a, a website, rockstarscars.co.uk. Um, so we've done a little bit more filming this year, but it's been quite reduced. Um, and yeah, I think now we've got, a, I suppose, a, the third incarnation of the team. I think we have certainly been told what we've got to do to get it, get, get it on telly, basically. Yeah, Which, yeah okay. I remember watching the first, uh, the first pilot kind of thing that you recorded, I think it was, when we had the, the I can't remember what the lady's name was. Beatrice. Beatrice, yeah, and you were in the the uh, hangar, ultimately, I think it was, uh, with the car in the middle, and you were introducing it kind of thing. I think that was pretty cool. But for anyone that's not seen it, it's ultimately talking to rock stars, funnily, about the cars they've owned and the, the cars that they've liked and disliked their careers and a few other bits and bobs. So I think anyone that's interested in, in music, and especially in the rock industry, and interested in cars, it's definitely worth a watch. Thank you very much. Well, we're hoping to, uh, yeah, to have a full series, TV series within 12 months now. So I think we've uh, been through enough. But it's like anything else. The first time you do something, it's not going to go to plan. It's not going to come off straight away. 
I think tenacity, in fact, it's probably one of the things I should have mentioned earlier. Tenacity is the thing, just when someone says no, just keep going. Um, and, you know, we did it all wrong. We've done it entirely in reverse. Um, mm. But now we've come to the point where um, we're in this COVID bubble. People haven't been able to film or we have got content. So now people are like, oh, what content have you got? And oh, what shot in HD? Hmm. It's now it's now a different it's now a different discussion, um, and um, I think the the last sort of five ten years of, of doing it have taught me more skills, and we've got a better network of people, um, and we kind of know what people want. Um, it's a mixture of knowing people like to know some of the geeky stuff. Actually, um, mm. they want to know that little minute more detail than than you might ordinarily get. Um, so that's what we're hoping to deliver is, um, I suppose, rock, geek, chic. Yeah, fair enough, mate. That sounds good. So I think on that note, we could probably call it a wrap. So thank you very much for your time. It's been fantastic. And you, mate. Take care.